This is one way of determining what microbes are available in the air. We would use something called geospatial analysis and we'd create these random locations across the park and you'll find that there are thousands of different microbes just on the surface of these petri dishes after a few hours in the day. Microbiology has come a long way in the last few decades thanks to advances in genetic sequencing technology. And it's now possible for scientists to investigate how microbial life has been depleted in different environments. The next step is assessing how to reverse the loss of diversity in our cities. I'm in London to meet the researchers that are trying to restore the urban microbiome. Dr. Jake Robinson is a microbial ecologist and author. Okay, so Jake, what is the urban microbiome and why is it such an important thing, not just for humans, but for promoting and supporting nature more generally? So let's talk about the microbiome in general first. So the microbiome refers to all of the microbes within a given environment. So um, we can look at the body as a human ecosystem, a walking ecosystem. And the same thing occurs in the wider environment. So all the, the soil and the plants, the trees, etc., they have their own microbial communities and they play a really fundamental role in the, the health of the ecosystem. So it's, microbes are really important for both humans but also the rest of nature. We are sitting in a very urban environment. What has happened to the urban microbiome in places like this? So in densely urban environments, and there's evidence to show that microbial community diversity, so that's the number of different species, dramatically decreases. Um, sorry, there's a dust storm coming in. Yeah. Oh, well, there is, isn't there? <laughs> we're getting coated in microbes <laughs> as we're talking. <laughs> so each one of these dust particles contains microbes, and we're currently being coated in them. <laughs> Let's scrap it then, shall we, for a bit? As Jake was explaining, there is now clear evidence to show that in cities and urban spaces, the removal of nature has resulted in depleted microbial diversity. But is this really a bad thing? Throwing our plans out the window out there. Yeah. Um, maybe we just go through the backstory a bit then. Yeah, from the 19th century, we've had this germ theory develop that pathogenic microbes cause human diseases. Obviously, over time, we've developed these cleanliness strategies, we've created um, detergents, we've prevented ourselves from being outside, um, and this has uh, led to this rise in non communicable diseases. So these are immune diseases or chronic diseases and at the same time we've seen biodiversity decrease so we're seeing these two global megatrends occurring at the same time and now we're, we're trying to link it to uh, reduce exposure to microbes in the environment which is um, affecting our immune systems. With this newfound knowledge and worrying effects to our health what can built-up cities actually do to tackle these megatrends? Jake has brought me to see a project he's been working on. So we're in Elephant Park, so it's quite a recent park in the centre of London. Obviously we've got the mature trees here, so these have been here for quite a while, but the rest of the vegetation has um, only recently been planted in the last couple of years. And the idea of the scheme was to improve the quality of the living environment for the local community. I was hired to provide an assessment of this park um, in relation to how good the theatres are in promoting the microbiome of the environment, um, from a human health perspective mostly. What did you find? So we found that this park was actually moderate to quite good and it's actually very good relative to a lot of other urban parks. Um, so for example, they've retained the mature trees, um, they've, they've created this slightly undulating topography which could potentially create an evenness of microbes in the air. They retained quite a lot of native species, so that's really important. It's also made the area quite for the public to engage with the nature itself. So we've got like children's playing areas, sand pits, people can touch the vegetation. Jake and his colleagues have developed a toolkit for examining these spaces, known as MIGI, or Microbiome-Inspired Green Infrastructure. So this is one way of determining what microbes are available in the air around us. So before we go out on the site, we would um, 
used something called geospatial analysis and we'd create these random locations across the park. We'd map them out so then once we come out to the site, put these Petri dishes in these random locations. So it just prevents um, selection bias so that we're not choosing a specific area. We'd place these on stakes so we wouldn't necessarily put them on the ground, but some study designs might require that. This, this is quite a monoculture habitat so this would probably have a less diverse okay. microbiome than some of the more complex vegetation. So you know we'd, we'd keep dotting them around in the park yeah and we'd uh, we'd leave them there for six to eight hours and the microbes just to give people an idea I mean they yeah, just yeah. land on it naturally yeah so because they're everywhere exactly right we're surrounded we're, we're surrounded breathing by, them in we're breathing them in they're we're landing on the ground okay. yes yeah, so we're emitting these microbial clouds ourselves we're also ingesting and breathing in the microbes from the environment and so you'll find that there are thousands of different microbes just on the surface of these petri dishes after a few hours in the day it's amazing because when you think of biodiversity mm. you think of things you can see you know the exactly. plants the flowers the trees yeah exactly but and so there's a whole other world there's an invisible world out there of invisible biodiversity it's sort of out of sight out of mind you know we're exactly. not thinking is, enough yeah. about actually the air we breathe and exactly it's really exciting when you think about it that there's this whole other kingdom of life that's this bustling metropolis that we can't see they're all interacting there's lots of energy flows competition all the things you'd see in the uh, the macro world is all going on in the microscopic world as well once these samples have been collected they're taken back to the lab and run through sequencing equipment which allows the genetic material present to be analyzed to see which microbes are present and what functional roles they're playing. And then this essentially shows you that the alpha diversity, so the number of species within the samples, increases as the vegetation gets more complex. The exposure to more different kinds of species is thought to be more beneficial for human health. And we also found indications that the relative abundance of pathogens is also much higher in these less complex habitats. So pathogens come through a lack of diversity? Um, so yeah, so opportunistic pathogens. So these are pathogens that are more fleeting, but they'll, they'll sort of um, uh, they'll take an opportunity when they see one. So if there's an environment's disturbed, they'll try. They'll move in and they'll say, "Hey, we're we're here to cause havoc." So in a more established ecosystem, you have these longer-term species that are more adapted to the environment. And they can outcompete the pathogens. Okay. Um, and so when you've got these monoculture habitats, there's more likely to be these opportunistic pathogens. And this shows a study that when you spend a certain amount of time in a green space, say an hour, the samples from the skin, um, the microbiome alpha diversity significantly increases. How do they get into the body then? Are yeah, they so mostly ingested or can they be absorbed through the skin? Yeah, both. So, okay. so essentially the air is the, ma the main medium that we're going to be exposed to microbes unless we are physically interacting with the vegetation in the soil, which obviously kids probably do more than adults. All around this area, and in fact still carrying on now, is major urban development, urban spaces, a massive polluting roundabout. Yeah. Is this space still able to have an impact on human health with all that around it? Or does there really need to be more? Does it need to be a whole city approach? So the park itself does provide health benefits for people within it, interacting within it. But like you say, it does need to be a citywide um, affair where we, we're connecting the habitats up with green corridors, which provides that the route for wildlife to be, then be able to disperse um, instead of hitting these big grey physical barriers like buildings and roads, etc. What about building materials? So the building materials is, was another consideration as part of this assessment, looking at uh, what's called bio-integrated um, architecture. And so this is very um, simply is the integration of biology within the architectural skins themselves. So trying to design um, walls and roofs, etc., so that um, they're more bioreceptive and so that so that microbes and what are called cryptogams, so these are mosses, lichens, ferns, etc., they're more easily able to colonise the, the building material. So we're not just looking at these um, de desolate surfaces, they're actually, uh, they promote biodiversity, which is likely to have a, an important impact on the, the microbiome as well.